What is up, YouTube? I'm Devon DaVinci, leader of the Renaissance crew, and you're watching DaVinci Reacts. Today I have uh, another video that I'm choosing to watch because it's something I don't know a lot of, and I would like to learn more about it. So this is uh, Extra History. They did a video on the first opium war. Now, this is uh, it says it's part one. I'm guessing based on the icon, it's part one of five, in which case I will do all five parts of the, this video. I am somewhat, I'm only like a little bit familiar about uh, the, the opium war. I know it was between Britain and China. I know that it was about Britain trying to get them addicted to opium. <clears throat> I know that China had banned opium because of it. And I know that it had something to do with the uh, creations or the independence of Hong Kong in some way. But, well, independence is probably a strong word for that. I'm, it, it, it has something to do with Hong Kong not necessarily having a direct tie with China. And I know with all the stuff happening in Hong Kong and China right now, which, by the way, I don't agree with. I think that Hong Kong, I think if the people in a certain country uh, wants to choose to be, wants to choose to govern their what country a certain way, it shouldn't be up to some other country to just overthrow that. No matter, and I know it's ironic coming from an American, <laughs> but uh, I, I disagree with what we did as well. If a, if a group of people decide to vote for a, a particular air, a direction or whatever they want to do, then I have no problem with them doing that. Unless it's 100% morally wrong, like the damn Nazis. Like, okay, that, that makes sense. <laughs> but uh, with that being said, I know it's a much more complicated issue, and that's something that I have to look more into as well. But let's jump into this and see what it has to offer. Uh, just a quick note, I will have a link for his, uh, Extra History's channel at the end of this video. The last 30 seconds, you'll see an icon pop up. You can click on it. It'll take you to their channel. You can like, subscribe, watch their videos, all the other good stuff. And I will have a link for the original video in the description box down below. Now, if you want to watch the video without me talking over it, that is where you would go to. If you want to watch the video as your own reaction, maybe you're another reactor, that is the link you will use to get to the original video. And if you want to show the original content creator support, the best way you can do it is watch their video. What I recommend is right click the original link, open it in a new window, put the video on mute and have it play in the background while you're watching my video. Uh, by the time my video ends, their video will end as well. So you'll give both of us a view. So you'll be supporting both channels without having to watch the video twice. Now let's jump into this. In 1792, Britain has just come out of a war that's cost it not only much of its national treasury, but also one of its most lucrative overseas colonies, North America. The empire needs new sources of revenue, new opportunities for trade, and there's one clear Is he possibility. Trade with pubic hair? China. By the end of the 18th century, the world had become a much smaller place, with European traders traveling the globe to feed the hungry markets of the industrializing West. Wars were fought all over the planet to secure exotic goods or the raw materials needed to power new economies of the rising European empires. But China still remained aloof. Demand for Chinese goods was high. Silk, porcelain, and especially tea were coveted by buyers back in Europe. This kind of goes into a video that I've watched. I haven't done a reaction to it, but I did watch it. I believe it was called Trump's Biggest Mistake He's Made in Office. And it's a video that centers around China and the impact China's had on the trade market going back to ancient times and what happened that made them lose control of that and how they're gaining uh, control of trade markets again today. Um, if you haven't seen it, just look it up. It is a very interesting video to watch. And this kind of talks about it, how China is really independent as far as its reliance on other countries for resources. Because at this time, everything that everybody wanted, China pretty much had. Like, all the most valuable resources, China just naturally had it, and other countries were still out trying to find and look for a proper way to get it. Now, once North America and the United States really started to become, like, to grow into its own and become its own, like, powerhouse country, the grip that China had on the world market disappeared because of America's ability to also 
get everything and even ship it out at a much more efficient rate. But anyway, check that video out if you want to see uh, to read more about it. It's kind of like a documentary. It's about like two hours long. But with that being said, let's jump back into it. But the Chinese emperors saw all these foreign traders as a potentially destabilizing influence, and as they had done throughout Chinese history, placed strict controls on foreign trade. Specifically, they limited trade to just a few ports. Traders weren't allowed to set foot in the empire, except at a handful of cities designated for that purpose. And all trade like had Japan. to go through a trade monopoly known as the Hong, who could tax and regulate foreign trade as they saw fit. By the middle of the 18th century, this was taken further, and all foreign trade was restricted to a single port, Canton. This drove resentment among the European traders who... Yeah, this goes into um, the, one of the issues with China was that they didn't want to adapt. They always, they saw themselves as the other countries being lucky that China is willing to grace them with their presence when it comes to trade. So they didn't even, like feel the need to adapt like everybody should have just been grateful that china was even trading with them to begin with and that was one of china's biggest problems the fact that they weren't really willing to adapt to the changing world but i mean when you have the pretty i want to say monopoly but when you have when you're the go-to trade partner for over three thousand years you would kind of it would be understandable why you would think that you don't need to adapt maybe you just thought that this was another trend that was going to come and go and everybody would be coming back to you at some point to get you know resources but industrialization changed everything for china to a single port canton this drove resentment among the european traders who saw limitless opportunity for profit if they could just get their hands on it and those europeans trading in china were in some ways a self-selecting group if you're going to make your living transporting goods thousands of miles from your home, you probably believe in the inherent value of unrestricted trade, which meant that these rules did not sit well with the Europeans, and piracy and smuggling began to rise. Even within the official channels of trade, merchants began to strain at these limitations. Eventually, an employee of the Honorable East India Company, the militarized trade organization responsible for British affairs in India, or as I like to call them, Shinra, because that's pretty much what they were. <laughs> For those of you that are familiar with Final Fantasy VII, the, the um, East Indian Company was Shinra. They had their own military. They had their own area that they governed. Like They were the... like When it comes to crony capitalism at its finest, when it comes to pure capitalism, the East Indian Company was just that pushed by what he saw as abuses of corrupt officials and undue restrictions on free trade decided that it was time to openly break the rules that the chinese imposed he left canton and took his grievances upriver literally and figuratively wanting to be heard by someone in the chinese hierarchy who was outside the hong outside the monopoly set up in canton and here's where divides of culture come in because it's possible that he wasn't acting in a way that he saw as malicious or even inappropriate. In fact, he may have been acting in a way that he thought of as perfectly reasonable were he in England. But he wasn't in England, and the arrogance of this traitor just deciding that his complaints should be elevated to imperial court rather than going through the proper authorities was unbelievable to the Chinese. More than that, it put into question whether these Europeans would stay in one port at all or even obey Chinese law and so further restrictions were put into place. Trade was clamped down on even more. But European demands for Chinese goods, especially English demands for their newfound love of black tea, continued to grow. Which brings us back to 1792. Let that be a lesson. Change does not stop for anybody. If, there's, if the winds of change are blowing, you're not going to stop it. Period. The problem with the Chinese is they got more and more restrictive as time went on, and... Like I said, once that change train is moving, it's like, if you get in the way, all you're going to do is get ran over. By this point, the British were importing tens of millions of pounds of tea every year. Within two decades, import duties on tea would account for 10% of the government's entire revenue. Tea was one of the major drivers of the economy. Tea was so essential to the British world that the Canton system was simply no longer acceptable. And more than that, the British were now running an enormous trade deficit with the Chinese. Millions of pounds of silver were flowing out of the British Empire and into China. On top of that, recent European struggles had cut them off from the silver mines of South America, and costly foreign wars had left the treasury dry. 
Even the Honorable East India Company was broke, incurring a huge debt to finance their military conquests of parts of India. The British Empire, for all of its power and its wealth, for all its global might and territory in every region of the globe, simply did not have the raw currency it needed to continue paying for its tea habit. So, the British decided that it was time to finally send an official diplomatic mission to China. No more traders, merchants, or pirates. This was going to be a real envoy from one monarch to another to talk about opening up trade. After some consideration, it was decided that the first Earl of McCartney, a seasoned colonial governor, should lead the mission. His aims were simple. That's a lot of season. The Canton system, establish a permanent embassy, or at least get a permanent British representative in the imperial court, and if possible, secure the grant of a small island off the coast of China where British merchants could operate under British rather than Chinese law. So they packed the hold of a ship with clocks and telescopes and even carriages to be presented to the Chinese emperor and began their trip. They sailed east around the Cape of Good Hope, with only one minor detour when the trade winds pushed them all the way to Rio de Janeiro. At last, though, Damn, they arrived how do you, in China. You get pushed across the entire asked ocean? To dock at a port much closer to Beijing than Canton. This was considered bad form by the Chinese, but representatives of the East India Company explained that they had expensive gifts for the emperor on board and didn't want any of them to get ruined in a long overland journey, so the Chinese acquiesced. They and their goods were ferried up the Grand Canal to Beijing, and here they assembled their gifts and prepared for the last leg of their journey, over the Great Wall and to the Emperor's Summer Palace at Jahal. Here they finally met the Emperor. And trouble began immediately. <laughs> because in the presence of the Emperor, it was expected that everyone kowtow, or kneel and bow so low that their head touched the floor. And McCartney, being a seasoned British governor and gentleman, hailing from what he believed was the most powerful and civilized nation in the world with, as he saw it, the most divine monarch, and not only the right but the duty to spread the British way around the globe, refused to do so. After all, if he wasn't going to touch his head to the floor for King George, he certainly wasn't going to do it here. So, after some wrangling and protestations, he proposed a counter-solution. He would perform the kowtow so long as, every time it was done, a Chinese official of equal rank would kowtow to a picture of George III. This was, of course, ludicrous to the Chinese, as, after all, they were from the most powerful and civilized nation in the world, with the most divine monarch, and who was this barbarian to try to put his king on anything like the emperor's level? Seriously. But even without the kowtow issue truly resolved, with McCartney merely genuflecting in the end, as he would to King George, the meeting went forward. McCartney showed off the marvels of British science, although mostly the flashier and less practical kind, and presented them to the Emperor. And here too, signals got crossed, because the Chinese court took this as a tribute mission. After all, all gift-giving missions to the Emperor are tribute missions, what else would it be? And yet the British thought that they were demonstrating all the reasons that China would benefit from opening up trade with them. So in the end, McCartney was dismissed without the Emperor agreeing to a single one of the goals he set out to achieve. And the Emperor sent one of the most gloriously, imperially snarky letters ever penned to King George, thanking him for his tribute which, though neither he nor the Chinese actually wanted it, he would graciously accept out of respect for how far George had sent people just to pay him tribute. But no, China didn't need bobbles or <laughs> really for shouldn't have. thank you. Trade would remain the way it was. So Britain was left with a massive trade deficit. The East India Company was 28 million pounds in debt as a result of their war in India, and the royal coffers were nearly dry. They needed to find some product the Chinese wanted. And then they did. Opium. Yeah. That is part one. Also, somebody did recommend that I check out a video about Suleiman. Which, I mean, since extra credit does it, I might get into that as well. Well, actually, before this ends, let me make sure there's nothing else. Okay. Um, yeah, this opens up more of a discussion because, obviously, the only thing I really knew about the Opium Wars was what popped up in the uh, History of the World, I guess, video, which is obviously a bit simplified. <laughs> Speaking of simplified... I would hope that there's a certain channel out there that does look into the opium wars. But this does open it up more and talks more about... Because um, I was always under the impression that Britain was kind of just like forcing the, everything onto China. Like they forced them to give them something and forced them to get on opium and things like that. Whereas this is more... It's more balanced. There was misunderstandings on uh, both sides. There was 
one side that felt they were being treated unfairly and the other side didn't really see it that way and it seems like China was really hell bent on trying to keep the relations the way it was and it wasn't enough for Britain but instead, instead of trying to listen to Britain's grievances and try to come up with some solution China kind of just like put their foot down and forced them to work the way they wanted them to at the point where they would at the point where they would create the policies that were even worse than what the British were not willing to agree with to begin with. So I uh, will be checking out part two. I uh, look forward to seeing what that has to offer. Um, and yeah, let's get this entire series taken care of. I'll, I'll hope to get more enlightened. <laughs> so thank you extra history for providing another uh, history video that can be taken in bite sized chunks and make it interesting for the viewer because I'm not much of a reader unless it's like manga and things like that but I'm not much of a person I'm not I don't like to sit down and read a lot I don't have the patience for it I I don't know how people do it <laughs> like I, I just can't do it like even even if I'm listening to an audiobook I have to be doing something while it's going on I can't just like sit back and just listen to it I have to I have to be doing multiple things at once now, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and give you the deuces. I look forward to seeing you guys on the next video. But until then, I'm Devon Da Vinci. Hopefully you've been a little more enlightened. I certainly have. And I will see you guys in the next video. Deuces.